Live NFL trivia every Tuesday night on Twitch at 9 p.m. Eastern. Come show off your football knowledge and have a chance to win cash prizes. Check the link in the description to find out more. And now, on with our feature presentation. If you ask people who is the biggest defensive snub in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and the best player on that side of the ball who is not yet enshrined in canon, odds are, a lot of people would point to this man right here. Tommy Nobis is not just one of the greatest defensive players in the over half century long history of the Atlanta Falcons, but might just be the greatest player in franchise history. I would be here all day if I listed every single accolade won by the Falcons linebacker, from his five Pro Bowls, to his spot in the Team Ring of Honor, to his jersey number being retired, an honor bestowed on only three other players in franchise history. Tommy Nobis is Mr. Falcon for a reason, and most people, especially those who were a fan of the team back in the early days, have nothing but positive things to say about the linebacker. But what you might not realize is that his time in Atlanta ended on a forgotten, sour note. By the time he played his last game for the Falcons in 1976, he was completely fed up with the franchise, and things reached a breaking point after a loss so bad that he momentarily left the team. And this is the story of the disastrous end to Tommy Nobis' legendary NFL career. Before I talk about the incident in question, we need some context as to just who Tommy Nobis is, because it will help us to understand everything about the situation at hand. Our story begins on November 27, 1965, when the Atlanta Falcons were about to make their first ever draft pick in franchise history. There was no one on the roster for this brand new expansion team, so they wanted to knock this first pick out of the park. I think it's safe to say that they did just that by drafting Texas linebacker Tommy Novus first overall. He signed with the Falcons over the Houston Oilers in the rival American Football League, and from that moment on, a team legend was born. As a rookie, Novus made an immediate impact in Atlanta, being named a Pro Bowler. He was the only Falcon to make the Pro Bowl during that 1966 campaign, and was so good that the Sporting News named him their Rookie of the Year, becoming the first defensive player in over a decade to receive this honor. While the Falcons were an understandably bad team that year, because no expansion team is ever good in their first season, Nobis was a definite bright spot, and something that the Falcons could build on from a defensive standpoint. And Nobis continued to improve. He was named a Pro Bowler and a first team All-Pro in 1967, and a Pro Bowler in 1968. When you're making the Pro Bowl in each of your first three years in the league, you're definitely doing something right. By the end of the 1960s, Nobis had achieved such notoriety that he was named to the All-1960s team, right next to eventual Hall of Fame linebackers like the great Dave Robinson and Dick Buckus. And he continued that hot play into the 1970s, when during the first year of the post-merger era, he started all 14 games and made it to the fourth Pro Bowl of his career. Two years later, he made it for a fifth and final time in 1972, when he recorded a career-high three interceptions and, once again, started all 14 games. Nobis was considered by many to be the best middle linebacker in pro football, and if it wasn't for the fact that he was playing in Atlanta, a team that was not very good and received little to no media coverage, it probably wouldn't even be a debate. Unfortunately for Nobis, there was one small problem. He never found his way into the postseason. Over his first 10 seasons, the Falcons never made the playoffs and only once did they finish with a winning record. When you've won just 46 games and 140 tries in 10 seasons, it's going to take a toll on you mentally. And in 1976, things went completely haywire for Nobis and company. I don't think anyone had any reasonably high expectations for the Falcons heading into the 1976 season. They went 4-10 the previous year, and after a 2-2 start, finished by losing 8 of their final 10 games. Their offense and defense ranked in the bottom half of the league, and the only real saving grace for Atlanta was the belief that starting quarterback Steve Barkowski, the first overall pick in 1975, would improve and maybe make Atlanta a respectable team under head coach Marion Campbell. As you can probably guess, that did not happen at all. The season started off with a bad 30-14 loss at home to the division rival Los Angeles Rams, in a game so bad that Atlanta turned the ball over four times, and Barkowski threw three interceptions while getting sacked five times and posting a passer rating of 39.1 which is worse than if he did nothing but spike the ball into the ground on every single play. Atlanta followed that up with a 24-10 loss against the Detroit Lions, in a game where they turned the ball over five times, and where Barkowski went 5-16 for 16 with 59 yards, no touchdowns, three interceptions, and a passer rating of 3.9. I don't think I need to show you how bad that one is. After beating the Bears, they followed that up with a 14-13 loss to the Philadelphia Eagles, in a game where the Falcons led 13-0 at the half, and Barkowski got sacked six times. And then, they lost to the New Orleans Saints 30 to nothing. Whether it was Barkowski or Kim McQuilkin under center, they combined to go 11 for 31 with no touchdowns and two interceptions, as the team turned it over seven times. Following an awful 1-4 start, understandably, there was some frustration on all sides. The players were frustrated, and the front office was frustrated. Marion Campbell was fired after five games, 
and was replaced by General Manager Pat Pepler. Now, there are certain people that can reasonably handle the duties of being the GM and the head coach. However, when Pepler is saying flat out, my ambitions are not to be a football coach, when he's saying I would be foolish right now to step on the field, and when he hadn't coached at any level in over 14 years, that's not a good sign. Side note, Pepler said that in the introductory press conference that if he had his way, the coach that would have succeeded him in Atlanta would be Bill Walsh. Talk about that possibly changing NFL history forever. But I don't think it's a surprise to anyone that things did not immediately improve with Pepler running the ship. In Week 6, they lost 20-17 to to the Cleveland Browns, in a game where the Browns averaged 5.6 yards per carry and picked up 321 yards on the ground. When you're allowing Greg Pruitt to post 212 yards from scrimmage, you know that's not ideal. They followed that up with a 15-0 loss to the San Francisco 49ers in a game that was brutal on the eyes. Atlanta finished that game with 7 first downs and 44 total yards, including negative 39 net passing yards. No, that is not a mistake on my end. Negative 39 net passing yards. And now, after a victory over the Saints in Week 8, they were ready to take on the Seattle Seahawks in Week 9. This is where an already awful season would find a way to get even worse. November 7, 1976. We head to the Kingdome for this matchup between the Atlanta Falcons and the Seattle Seahawks. This would normally be the part of the video where I talk about how this was a big game for both teams, and how this game meant a lot and their season was on the line. But who are we kidding? Both of these teams are terrible and have no shot whatsoever at making the postseason. The Falcons are 2-6 and, and are 4 back of a playoff spot. The Seahawks are 1-7. We're looking at two of the worst teams in the league. However, the Seahawks had the excuse of being an expansion team. They were not only still looking for their first home win in franchise history, but were looking for their first win against a non-expansion team. The only win on Seattle's 1-7 record was against the winless Tampa Bay Buccaneers in a battle of the first-year teams. If Seattle was going to win a game against a non-expansion team, then a home game against this really Falcons team with a clueless head coach was a good start. And sure enough, this was a demolition. For Seattle fans waiting to finally have a reason to erupt in the Kingdome, they got a ton of them in this game. The Seahawks led it by a commanding score of 30-6 to at the end of three quarters, and while a garbage time touchdown by Kim McWilkin to Alfred Jenkins in the fourth quarter made the score somewhat more respectable at 30-13, to this game was truly a blowout. Seattle finished the game averaging over five yards per carry, picking up 196 yards on the day. Keep in mind that this was a Seahawks team that finished the season as the worst rushing team in football and had just 295 yards over the previous month. They had their way with Atlanta's run 7 today. Seahawks quarterback Jim Zorn had been terrible all season. In the previous two games, he had a 23.2 passer rating with no touchdowns and an abysmal 7 interceptions. In this game against the Falcons, he threw for two touchdowns and no picks while posting a passer rating of 100.8. Keep in mind that Zorn had never had a game with a passer rating above 70, and here he was, slicing and dicing Atlanta's poorest defense. Atlanta turned it over six times. Mick and Meyer missed two field goals. Atlanta quarterbacks combined to complete 31% of their passes. Whatever stat you want to bring up from this game, it was bad. And afterwards, one man took the loss harder than anyone. After 11 seasons, Tommy Nobis finally hit his breaking point. Losing is hard on anyone, and especially for a guy like Nobis who had been around for over a decade with Atlanta and was going nowhere, he was furious. He had a team in a tailspin that had been losing forever. He had a coach that basically admitted to having no idea what he was doing. And you had teammates that, in his eyes, were not giving it their all and were not trying. And Nobis didn't want to be associated with that anymore. After the game, Nobis walked out and voiced his frustrations to Pepler and the front office about the players and the way the team was being run. With that, it seemed like he was calling it quits. He missed practice that Tuesday, and Pepler, along with the team's spokesperson, made it seem like that was the end of his career. Pepler said that he'd be considering retirement anyway because of his bad knees, as Nobis had a notoriously bad knee problem throughout his career, and a spokesperson didn't know any information about Nobis other than the fact that he wasn't at practice that Tuesday. This season was already a chaotic and terrible one, and now losing Mr. Falcon himself made things that much worse. Having said that, Nobis did return later in the week, though he did not speak with the press about his unannounced absence. It seemed like the Falcons were just ready to treat the whole incident as water under the bridge, get it over with, and they welcomed Nobis back with open arms. But it was abundantly clear after this whole ordeal that this 1976 season, if it wasn't already shaping up to be his last in Atlanta, was going to be. He was fed up, and at this point, all that was left to do was finish up one of the worst seasons in franchise history on at least a somewhat respectable note. Did that wind up happening? Not really. Things didn't get too much better for Atlanta after that whole ordeal. The Falcons finished the season with a 4-10 record, 
And while there was the high note, where they stunned the 9-1 Dallas Cowboys in a result that no one saw coming, and might be one of the biggest regular season upsets in the NFL during the 1970s, there was the infamous low note of a 59-0 loss to the Los Angeles Rams, in a game where the Falcons had 81 yards of offense, and the Rams had 569. I don't think it's too surprising when the Rams had over 500 more yards of offense that they won that game in rather convincing fashion. When the season ended, Nobis announced his retirement, and took a role in the front office. It didn't seem like there was too much bad blood or animosity at that point, with the Seahawks incident being a distant thing of the past, and with the Falcons gladly accepting Nobis to continue being a part of the organization in some capacity. And with that, an absolutely storied career came to an end. Five Pro Bowls, a first team and second team All-Pro, a Hall of Fame all 1960 nomination, and 132 starts later, Nobis was calling it quits and would go down as the greatest Falcon of all time. Even today, you will get tons of people saying that Nobis was the greatest Falcon ever, and if you have that opinion, I wouldn't blame you in the slightest bit. He commanded the middle of the field, and was one of the only bright spots on a brutal decade-long stretch of pro football down there. But even though Nobis is remembered fondly today, and even though Nobis and the Falcons were close all the way until his unfortunate passing in 2017, for a brief moment in 1976, there was a time where Nobis wanted absolutely nothing to do with the Falcons. After years and years of losing, when you consider the state of dysfunction that the franchise was in, and the lack of effort given by the players in his eyes, a loss to the expansion Seattle Seahawks was the metaphorical straw that broke the camel's back. Get your official Jaguar Year 9 merchandise by going to jg9shop.com, and be sure to like this video, ring the notification bell, subscribe down below if you haven't already, as it helps the channel out a lot, and be sure to check out Twitch every Monday and Tuesday night at 9pm Eastern for your chance to play NFL trivia and win cash prizes. Link in the description below. If you want to see videos like this condensed down to 60 seconds, then follow me on TikTok at jrgator9 and subscribe to 60 Second NFL History on YouTube. To see highlight videos of players throughout the history of the NFL, subscribe to JG9 Highlights. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping on the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. So you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.